spot different exposure to companies have. But we should go back a step just to finish uh, this reading on the purchasing power party theory. So this one is about uh, Mexico and the torpedo prices. So just to review the GPP. So I can you close the door at the back, please? So, according to the purchasing power parity, the exchange rate change is linked to the change in inflation over the long time. So we said high inflation, at the end the high inflation is weak currency. So this is just a practical, a practical example of why if prices are changing, the exchange rate also changes. So, do you understand tortilla? Yes. Do you like tortillas? Yes. So tortilla, Mexicans eat the tortilla. It's like the a little bit like bread, flat bread, right? So increase in the cost of tortillas has triggered a slump in the peso, right? This is a news article from Bloomberg. What does slump mean? Is slump going up or going down? Going down. So, just it explains that tortilla is a flatbread made out of corn and water. Mexicans often eat this for breakfast, lunch and dinner. What do Koreans eat for breakfast, lunch and dinner? Rice. Rice and kimchi. So you can imagine if we were in Korea, we'd be talking about cabbage. Do you understand cabbage? Do you like cabbage? Not really, only if it has a red spice and fish taste. If it has a fish taste mixed with cabbage, then it's nice. Yes? No? You don't like to fish taste kimchi? Yes. Do you like fish taste kimchi? No? You don't like fish taste kimchi? Yes, you do like kimchi. No. Oh, you don't like fish? Yes, you do. English and Korean is the opposite, right? If I say in Korea in English, you don't like something, what's the answer? Yes or no? The answer is no in English. In Korean, you'll say yes. But if you say yes in English, it means you do like it. Okay? So, uh, tortilla prices went up in January, okay, by 6%. If you remember a couple of years ago, Korea, the cabbage price went up because there was a lot of rain and the farmers lost uh, some cabbages, right? So, why? The, the corn price climbed, okay? So this increase made inflation and a bond market route. So route means people are not buying the bonds. Okay, so the peso has fallen by 2.3% in the last month. So what happens? Tortilla price increases. Then people ask for higher wages, okay? Uh, if the price of rice and cabbage is going up in Korea, are people going to ask for higher wages? If there is inflation, inflation in the food price in Korea, are people going to ask for higher wages? Yes, the workers are going to ask their bosses, right, for higher wages because of that reason. So, foreign investors don't like this environment. Okay, we could have a circle. <coughs> they are selling the peso, so then the peso becomes weaker. So, <coughs> corn prices was very high. Okay. Corn price can also drive up the cost of livestock feed, food for cows and, and pigs. So eggs and chicken and beef also get more expensive, right? So this is just a practical example of the PPP. Okay. Price goes up, we have inflation, people ask for higher wages, we can have more inflation, and the currency is going to get weaker on the foreign exchange market. Okay. Do you have any question about this case study? No? No. Okay, then let's go back and continue with the... 
exposure we were talking about the last time. We're going into the edging. So the last time we talked about transaction exposure and economic exposure. Can anybody tell me what is the difference between uh, transaction exposure and economic exposure? We studied in the last class. Can anybody tell me the difference between transaction exposure and economic exposure? Transaction exposure is related to the contract, yes? Companies what? FDI of building factories for another country. So they invested in another country and they have what? The other country, if the currency gets <coughs> strong, mm -hmm. then their land will be banned because it's more expensive. Okay, so we talk about the future unknown, right? Economic one, future unknown. Like revenues or costs. If we do FDI, the cost of the wage could go up, right? Or the cost of the land could go up. Okay? Transaction, we are talking about contracts. So we know it's also future, but it's known. Okay, which one is easier? to deal with? This one or this one? No. The known one. What should we do for a known one? What did we learn that we could do to hedge the known risk? Make a forward contract, okay? So, uh, basically foreign exchange exposure is related to buying assets which are in a currency other than the home currency, okay? So, we, the home currency market price of the assets can be changed and the cash flow can also be affected. <clears throat> so, if we look at equities, who studied the financial management last semester? Hands up if you studied financial management. Okay. If I buy a stock, what kind of risks do I have? What different kinds of risks do I have? If I'm deciding to buy a stock, what different kinds of risks do I have? Can you remember? Exchange rate risk, yes. Other types of risk? Company risk, yes. Any other type of risk? Country risk, right? Any other type of risk? Industry, industry risk, right? In the US, currently the biotech industry fell by 10% last year. Why last week? One of the reasons Hillary Clinton said that if she's president, she's going to stop them from charging too high prices. Okay, so because Hillary Clinton might be the future president, and she said that, the whole industry went down by 10%. Okay, so we have the industry risk. So, <coughs> company risk, okay, environment risk by the industry, by the competition, by the government regulation. Okay, uh, market risk is the one we can't diversify. We can diversify this, we can diversify this. What does it mean to diversify the risk? How? How can I diversify company risk? Several companies. So last March I say, oh I really like Volkswagen, I think they make great cars. I'm going to get all my money and invest in Volkswagen. Right? 
can't my father to sell the house? <laughs> right? Get the money, put everything into the Volkswagen stock. Why? Volkswagen is, I have a Volkswagen car. Volkswagen is from Germany. They don't have any corruption, right? Germany is a perfect country. Couldn't be a safer investment. Okay, then what happens in June? They find out that there was some scandal in the Volkswagen company, so I lose uh, about 30 or 40 percent of my money in the short term. Maybe it will come back in the long term, right? So <clears throat> we can diversify by investing in Volkswagen and BMW, okay, and Kia, and investing in different industries, in biotech, in IT, and so on. We can't diversify the market risk. Okay, this is about the uh, overall movement of the market or economy. The exchange rate risk, can we deal with the exchange rate risk or not? Can we deal with this risk if we invest in another country? Can we get rid of the exchange rate risk? Hmm? Yes, how? Make a forward contract. Okay, we already talked about it. You invest in stocks in another country. Most of the funds, they're hedged or not hedged. We looked at the down finance, right? They had a hedge, hedged. It means they made a forward contract to hedge this kind of risk. Okay? So that is equities. What about bonds? For bonds, the main risk is default risk. Okay, credit risk. Who is going to tell us about the credit risk on bonds? Who will tell us about the credit risk in bonds? Who can we ask? What's the risk of that country or company make defaulting? You can ask the bank. They, they, they won't really tell us. Rating agencies. Rating agencies. What are the three big rating agencies? Pitch, S&P. Pitch, S&P. Yes. Moody's, right? So they will tell us about the default risk. The, that's the risk that they won't be able to pay back the debt. Okay. We have corporate bonds and sovereign bonds. So which is more likely to default, a corporate bond or sovereign bond, generally? Corporate which is more corporate. risky? Corporate bonds, right? Sovereigns can collect tax. Okay. Uh, the price risk, the price of the bond can go up or down. It can be sold in the secondary market. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so it depends on the company or the country. If their economy is going badly, the price of the bond will go down, right? We can have contagion from other countries, like in the Asian financial crisis. And then we have the exchange rate risk, okay? So again, we can diversify. If we invest in bonds, we can hedge our exchange rate risk. Do you understand hedge? Yes. Hedge is an easy word. Instead of saying, we can make a forward contract, and balance the risk so we don't have any risk. That's a very long way to say. Instead we say hedge. Okay, we can hedge the risk. <clears throat> so here we, we talked about the fund before on down. Do you remember we looked at down and we looked at the fund? Yes. Is it hedged or is it not hedged? So this is what we're looking at here. This is the returns of global treasuries with US treasuries, okay, hedged and unhedged. So the blue line, US dollar hedged, the red line unhedged, and the uh, yellow line US treasuries. So we have a choice, first of all, we can invest in the US bond, or we can invest in the bond in another country. Which one is going to pay us more interest? In another country? Usually, right? Let's say if we're investing in emerging economies or so on. Okay. Uh, which one is safer? The U.S. one is safer, right? So that's why we get a lower interest rate. So we have a choice. Uh, then we have second choice. If we invest in the bond abroad, are we going to hedge or not hedge? Okay. So uh, if we hedge. Because the forward contract is going to cut out the interest differential, we should be getting similar enough to the US, to the US bond, right? So we can see the blue line is similar enough to the yellow line, okay? 
blue and the yellow is not that far away. But slightly better here, here in the US, if I invest at home, maybe there's some transaction cost. You understand transaction cost? Yes. Of buying the one abroad, changing the money. The bank's buying and selling price for the forward contract has a cost. So hedging has a, has a cost, right? But what happened if we don't hedge the foreign ones? We're going to get a higher interest rate if everything, if their foreign exchange doesn't change much, right? If the exchange rate stays the same, we'll get a higher interest rate in Brazil or Russia or China, right? But if that, that currency gets weaker against the dollar, then we won't. So here we made a 20 very high percent profit, right here. But here we also made, so here we can guess what's happening. The dollar is getting stronger or the dollar is getting weaker? We're getting more money from, we invested abroad and we're getting more money back when we change back to US dollars. Is the dollar getting stronger or weaker? Weaker, right? If I invest, if I'm in Korea and I invest in Germany, do I want the Korean one to get weaker or stronger? Which is more advantageous for me? Hmm? The Korean one gets stronger? Let's say I have all my money, I invest all my savings in euros, right? Which is better for me? The euro gets stronger or the Korean one gets stronger? Euro gets stronger, the one gets weaker, right? So if I invest abroad, usually it's better for me that the foreign currency is getting stronger. Okay? So here the one is get, the dollar is getting weaker and the other one is getting stronger. But here it changes around. So this year the dollar must have been very strong. Foreign currencies were very weak. So even though I invested in the bond in another country with a higher interest rate, that country's currency got very weak, so I lost money. Okay? So overall, if you looked at the past, which would you prefer to do? Hedged or unhedged in the, in the, bond, in the foreign bonds? Which is better, the red line or the blue line, overall? Overall, the red line, probably, right? So in this case, you might be better off being unhedged. Okay? It means that probably the US dollar was weaker than we expected in those years. So if we feel the US dollar is going to be weak, then what are we going to do? Hedge or unhedge? If we think the US dollar will be weak. Unhedged. If we think the US dollar will be strong? Hedged. Okay? So this is just uh, giving an example. Uh, we can choose to do hedged or unhedged. Which is more risky? Hedged. Unhedged is more risky. It goes up and it goes down more. Okay? So, we're going to talk about using hedges, <coughs> operational hedges, okay? So what, can, what kind of hedging can we do? <coughs> so we're going to discuss hedging techniques, like forwards and options, okay? So, first of all, transaction exposure is easier to hedge. We said this, right? Transaction exposure is contracts, it's known. Okay, we have account receivable or account payable, exports or import contracts. I buy bicycles from the US. Imports. Okay? I'm going to get I'm going to have to pay them in US dollars. Accounts payable. Okay, usually the time is quite short, like three months or six months or one year. Sometimes it can be more than one year. Like in the case of Lufthansa. It's an airline we're going to look at, right? Uh, if they are going to make some airplanes for me, how long will it take to make the airplane? One month? Can they put an airplane together in one month? Say I order 50 airplanes. I'm Lufthansa, I order 50 airplanes from Boeing. How long will it take for Boeing to make 50 airplanes? Six months, they're very quick at making airplanes. I'm making a four, four year, three year. It's going to take a few years, right? A couple of years anyway, two or three years. So it could be longer depending on the type of contract we have. Okay? <coughs> so, uh, transaction exposure really is related to buying or selling, or borrowing, lending, 
or buying financial assets like stocks. Okay? I know I'm going to change back my stocks in the future, and I bought this much of stocks. So it's known. So we can use financial hedges like forward contracts, and we're going to talk about options later. Options is another financial hedge. But we can also use operational hedge. Operational hedge means uh, we are just doing something ourselves in our company instead of using finance. It's just that kind of strategy. So we can have risk shifting, netting, leading and lagging. So risk shifting means, what does it mean to shift the risk? What's another word for shift in this case? Moving. Moving. Shifting means moving, right? So we're moving the risk from us to the other person. So how can we do that? Make the invoice in our currency. Okay, that's not easy if we're from Korea though, right? Because maybe the other company doesn't want to make the contract in Korean won. Okay? Even if it's a Chinese and Korean company, they may ask for the contract to be in US dollars, not Korean won. Okay? But we can try that. We can ask them, how about we make the contract in Korean won? Then that means the other person has the risk, not us. Okay, the second one is netting. So I do some business in China. I, I buy imports in, from China, like some small chip for the phone. Okay? And then I sell my phones in China. So netting means I have one contract to change from Korean one to Chinese RMB to buy the chips. And I have another contract, which is the opposite. Getting the, I'm selling my phone, so I'm getting RMB and changing back to Korean one. Okay, so I have the two opposite type of contracts, so I, I don't need to do hedging, right? If they're the same amount, more or less, that's called netting. Okay, and then leading and lagging is if I think that the euro is getting weaker, and I have to pay my bills in euros. Am I, do I want to pay more quickly or pay more slowly? Euro is getting weaker. I think it will be 10% weaker in six months. Okay? Do I want to pay my bill now or pay later in six months? Later in six months. Okay, so we can... Leading and lagging is just speeding up or slowing down payments. What about the US dollar is getting stronger? I think it will be 10% stronger in six months. Should I pay now or pay later? It's easier to pay now, right? Pay more quickly. So that's leading and lagging. So, uh, as we said before, the US dollar is mainly used. So US companies are, don't have to worry as much. They can make their contracts in US dollars. Okay? Other countries, Euro is second highest currency in the world. Then the pound and smaller countries have to worry more about the risk of the exchange rate. <coughs> so netting, uh, big companies, they usually have, they're doing contracts in a lot of different currencies, right? So they have to look at their net exposure to currency risk. Right, we want to reduce our transaction cost. We don't want to be going to the bank all the time, making forward contracts. Okay, so we have this contract for one country, this contract for another country. Okay. So some country, companies do this uh, through their subsidiary. Some of them do it centrally. So sometimes the subsidiary <coughs> manages their own business. Sometimes the center, the global headquarters, manages the currency. Okay? Do you understand subsidiary? What is a subsidiary? Can anybody tell me what a subsidiary is? <coughs> what does that mean? Support. It's like the company can be divided up. You have the head company, and then you have the subsidiaries, right? In Disney, they have Walt Disney is the big company. They have a TV branch, right? Then they have another branch for movies. Then they have another branch for children's toys, okay? 
So those subsidiaries can do by themselves the currency transaction, or the head company can do it. So let's have a look at this example. So if we have centralized exposure management, then the headquarter needs to consolidate. Consolidate means like put together the net amount of inflows and outflows. Do you understand net in English? Gross and net? Usually we use for pay, gross pay. Okay, $1,000. Net pay is going to be minus tax. Okay, minus pension, minus health care. Okay, so net pay will be 980. Okay, so when we're talking about net, we mean that we're subtracting something else. From it. Okay, so in this case, we have we are subtracting the two contracts. So let's say we have subsidiary X and Y in a U.S. company. Subsidiary X has an inflow, a long position of five hundred thousand pounds. What does it mean, long position? They want the price to go up. They want it to get stronger, right? They are getting five hundred thousand inflow, receiving, right? Subsidiary Y has a short position of £600,000. So, what is the net situation here? What is the net situation? Short position of? What? 100000 right? Pounds. So, the net outflow for the corporation is £100,000. So, we need to hedge. Do we need to hedge this and hedge this? No, we can just find the net position and hedge the net position. Okay? So, if the pound weakens, it will be unfavorable to X but favorable for Y. Okay? So, we need to uh, make the hedging on just this one, on the Y, for 100,000. So, leading and lagging. Lagging is uh, coming behind. People are running, we say somebody is lagging behind. The other person is leading. So lagging means slowly or delayed. So this is about the timing. Leading, speeding up payments. Okay? If your home currency is getting weaker and the foreign currency is, foreign currency is getting stronger, we already asked this question, right? What do you do? Leading, more quickly. Okay, your home currency is getting stronger, the foreign currency is getting weaker. There's no hurry to pay a bill. You can wait until we get a better exchange rate in the future. So this is operational hedging without using the financial hedging. Financial hedging for a contract we looked at so far. So discuss with your partner what are the three ways of operational hedging. Yes. X company and Y company living the tradition. Uh, 
Greece doesn't produce its own energy. <laughs> Maybe they can ask Korea to make a nuclear power plant, right? In Greece. <laughs> then they don't have to worry about the oil. No. But they have to pay the Korean workers. Uh, output prices and sales. So if we are selling in the US and the US dollar suddenly gets weaker, are we going to have more revenues or less revenues? We're from Korea. We're selling in the US. US dollar suddenly gets weaker. Less revenues. Okay? Uh, global investor. Okay? We, we can uh, have changes in the prices. So, the effect of the F exchange results from our involvement in the market. Okay? How much do we have of costs? Do we have a factory in the other market? How much do we get our revenues from other markets? Right? So these days, most companies, we look at in a minute the US companies, but Samsung, what percentage of Samsung's revenue do you think they get from Korea? And what percent from outside Korea? 95% in Korea? 5% outside Korea? No? 50-50? You think that Samsung gets 50% of its sales in Korea? Hmm? So a small country like Korea, not, it's not small, right? It's the 12th largest uh, economy in the world. But compared to the global economy, Korea has 50 million people. There are 7 billion people in the world, right? So Samsung is selling its phones all over the world. So where is it getting its revenues from? Korea or outside Korea? Outside Korea, okay? Uh, also, it has many costs outside Korea. So we have we talked before about the indirect problem of the competition. Okay. So uh, foreign competitors exporting into our home country. So Toyota is selling cars in Korea. If the yen gets weaker, they get advantage. Uh, foreign companies setting up FDI activities in our home country. Okay. So this is uh, driven by globalization. So we'll talk about it later, but Kia and have set up a factory in, in Eastern Europe, right? And also in the US. Okay? One of the reasons is if the US dollar gets weaker, are Kia's revenues going to go up or down? The US dollar gets weaker. They're selling cars in the US. Will the revenue go up or down? No. Down, right? So if they have a factory in the US, their costs will also go down. Okay? So they're not hit that badly by the change in the, the foreign exchange. So we can see that uh, the US is a big market, right? 200, 300 million people. A lot of the world's companies are in the US. And the US people have a high income. So they, we already, they're consumers. They buy more than other ones, right? So if we think that seven out of the world's top ten companies are American, from the US, right? Then we can see here, IT sector, mostly American companies, they get 57% of their revenues from, another, from abroad, okay? Uh, if we think about some countries, companies like utilities and telecom service, services, hasn't really been globalized yet. Okay. Do KT operate in another country? No, not really. Right? There's some Spanish company operates in South America, and some European ones operate in Africa. So it depends on the kind of, of healthcare. Do a lot of people travel abroad for healthcare? Not that many, right? So financials, another one which hasn't been that globalized. The European Union is a good example because in Ireland, what should happen when we have globalization? The Irish banks did a bad job, right? Here's Germany, here's Ireland, okay? So the Irish banks should disappear and German banks should come to Ireland. What's the problem with the German bank setting up in Ireland? They don't know their Ireland rule. Yes, the regulation is different, right, in Ireland. So it's a headache for the Germans. They have to change a lot of things. The language is different. Okay, that's a big one. 
The bank knows the local customers. They have a lot of local knowledge, okay, with the local people and so on. So another one is government support. If Ireland, Irish government bailed out the banks, right? If Irish government didn't bail out the bank, then a foreign bank would come to Ireland and set up. Okay? So, uh, financial is still not completely globalized, right? But different sectors have different, more foreign sales exposure than other ones. <coughs> so here is Google. Uh, we can see that it's increasing. In 2004, non-US revenues was 33%. <coughs> 2010, 51%. Okay? Uh, Merck, healthcare, 56%. Uh, here we have energy companies, 64%. Pro do you know Procter & Gamble? <laughs> Procter & Gamble makes chocolate? That's washing up liquid. <laughs> Do you think the washing of liquid is chocolate? <laughs> Eating the washing of liquid? No? No? So, you know P&G? Oh, yes. What do they make? Already. Hmm? Toothpaste. Toothpaste, toothbrushes. They sell all over the world, right? So they're getting a lot of revenues from abroad. IBM, DD, Microsoft. <coughs> So, U.S. companies, Walmart, do you know Walmart? Yes. It has 5,000 stores in 14 foreign countries, China, India, the U.K. I think it came to Korea, but it didn't work well in Korea, right? Went left again. Uh, Bank of America, U.S. has a big financial industry. U.S. dollar has them. U.K. also a big financial industry. Ford, Boeing, Intel. Intel 85% from overseas. Okay? Amazon, 45% growing. McDonald's, 66% from overseas. Nike, 50% from overseas. Do you know the name of these you know these companies? Yes. One of the biggest companies in the world, right? Yes. So uh, here's McDonald's annual report. So <coughs> We can talk about the translation. So we have changing foreign currencies. McDonald's mitigates exposure by financing in local currencies. What does it mean, mitigate exposure? Increase or decrease exposure? Decrease. Hmm? Usually do we want to increase exposure or decrease exposure? Decrease. Decrease, right? So we can figure out, even if we don't understand mitigation, we know we're not going to be trying to increase exposure, right? And mitigate means decrease exposure. What does it mean financing in local currencies? What does financing mean? Hmm? Getting loans, okay? Getting loans in local currencies, okay? Hedging foreign denominated cash flows. So trying to hedge the cash flow okay, with the forward contract. Purchasing goods and services in local currencies. Okay. So if we get a loan, we're McDonald's, we can get a loan in the, in the foreign currency. Okay. So we don't have to get a loan in our currency to hedging, change to the foreign currency. So in 2010, on our results, the foreign currency translation had a positive result. So the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar was stronger. In 2009, foreign currency translation had a negative impact. Okay? It means that the, these currencies were all weaker. Okay? So this, the foreign currency translation is just accounting. Okay? So just when we show our accounts, it can be uh, look better or look worse depending on the situation. <coughs> so, uh, here we have the impact of the foreign exchange changes on sales. Okay. So, total sales, blue. 
and excluding the foreign exchange is red. Okay. So <coughs> here we can see in 2001, uh, we have here is our sales, and then excluding the uh, foreign exchange here. So we can see that it's grow this is the growth rate in percentage. So the growth rate is just 1% if we look at the sales uh, with the hedging. And then excluding the foreign exchange, so we don't do the hedging, then we can get uh, higher sales growth, right? So in this year, we can have uh, higher. So which one is more risky? Which line is moving up and down more, the blue or the red one? Blue one, right? So just if we don't do any hedging, this year we can have hardly any growth. Okay? This year we could have a lot of growth. But if we do our hedging, it's a more stable, stable situation, our sales growth. Okay? So we said that economic exposure involves unknown future cash flows. Okay? So what kind of things can we do here? So we talked about Kia, okay? setting up a factory in the US. So global diversification of production and sales markets okay? to provide natural hedges for the unknown foreign exchange exposure. Do you understand natural hedging? Natural. Diversification. If I'm selling everything in China, what's the risk? Well, China. It's weaker, right? But if I'm selling in China, in Russia, in the US, in Germany, maybe some currency will get stronger, some currency will get weaker, so it can even out more. So if I diversify my sales to sell to a lot of different markets, the foreign exchange risk can be slightly lower. Okay? I'm not sure how much I'm going to sell. I, it's not as easy to make the forward contract. Okay? So I just try to diversify in different countries and different currencies. The same for production. So if I'm only producing in China, what's the risk? I say, three years ago or four years ago, I say, oh, China's really cheap. <laughs> I'm going to set up all my factories in China. Right? Sell all my factories in Vietnam and Cambodia. Let's go to China, everything. <laughs> what's the risk? <coughs> The Chinese currency gets stronger, right? Then the wages go up in China. The land, if I want to expand, the land price is more expensive. Okay? So we can see that the companies can diversify their production in China, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, in Malaysia, in the US, okay? in different areas. Okay? Uh, this can help us with the, a natural, this is called a natural hedge. As long as the currencies do not move in the same direction, we can stabilize our home currency. Okay? So if we're in the US, it's a little bit more risky because the US can move more against other currencies, right? The, the other currencies kind of can move together against the US dollar. But other countries, it's not as clear. So uh, if we want to diversify our sales, Subway, they're in 98 countries. McDonald's, 117 countries. Okay, so if Subway was only in Europe, the Euro got very weak, Subway could have a problem. Okay, but Subway is not only in Europe, it's in Korea and other areas. So Europe has a problem, but maybe the emerging economy, China is growing, or other places growing, right? This can be not just for the foreign exchange risk, but also for the economic, economic risk. If some countries have a crisis. Okay, so... Uh, we can see the exact number here for McDonald's, okay? uh, mainly US and Europe, but we can see this in their uh, report, reports, right? Asia Pacific, Middle East, Africa, APMEA, right? 21%. So do you have any question then about what we studied today? there for today. <coughs>
Yeah.